Well, if you if you are probably anything like me, sometimes you may may wonder and, and uh, maybe even wish that that you could have been alive at the time of Jesus when he walked the earth, so that you may perhaps be taught by him, be discipled by him personally, and uh, that would then, of course, reveal your like my momentary lack of understanding that the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit. He has not left us to our own devices and He is indeed teaching and discipling us in person, even, even today. And uh, when, we, when we look to the Lord for, for discipleship, I think in, 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 one, in one sense, if you look at, at Jesus, we we always, almost always, think of His divinity, the fact that He is God, that He is, he is uh, God in, in, in the flesh. And, uh, but there's an equal uh, and an important truth to Christ's incarnation in that He was also truly man. He was truly God and He was truly man. And both are are of massive importance. We can't have the one without the other, otherwise we would not have a perfect substitute. We will not have a like-for-like -like sacrifice. Our redemption would not be possible. Um, Jesus had to come and be fully God and fully man, or truly God and truly man, without uh, mingling those two together, without confusing those two together, uh, and that is one of the mysteries of our faith, of the Christian faith, is how is that even possible? Now, I'm not this morning going to attempt to answer that. I really want to draw the attention that Jesus as a man is a, was a wonderful example to us to imitate when it comes to discipleship, to being discipled. He was the perfect man, the perfect disciple, the perfect example to follow. Um, perfect mold to be conformed into. It was the perfect teacher to learn from. And so this is what we will look at this morning, to be discipled by the servant. Because we are in, of course, in Isaiah 50, so if you're there, if you please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 50. In the third servant song, we, we've, we've already seen the first servant song we found in, in Isaiah 42, really De de declaring for us the coming of the servant and we saw that he would be a, the one chosen of God that he, the spirit of God would be upon him that he will come to establish justice that he will be gentle that he would not bruise a, a, a or, or break a bruised reed or snuff out a dimly burning wick that he was to be appointed a covenant for the people and a light to the nations and to set the captives free. All of that introduced to, to, to us the servant of God in, in Isaiah 42. Then in Isaiah 49 we find the second servant song really describing to us the work of the servant. That he would be a man, that he would be born of a woman, that he would be named or called from the womb. And... Uh, that he will be given a mouth like a sharp sword, again indicating that he has a, a word ministry and speaking justice and righteousness and that he will glorify God and he was tasked to bring back Israel to the Lord and to restore them to their land and also to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That again we see in chapter 49 that he will be a light to the nations and a covenant to the people Although he will be despised and abhorred, a servant of, of, of rulers, yet he will be exalted. Now we come to the third servant song, and we are in chapter 50, verse 4 through to 11. So let me read that for us, and then I'll make some comments before we go on. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, uh, sorry, chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord God has given me a the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. 
I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a cause, a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with firebrands, walk in the light by your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Really, we see here the, the servant who we recognize, of course, is is from, from these texts already and of course further from, from Isaiah uh, 40, uh, sorry, 52 verse 32 all the way through to chapter 53 that he is, uh, that the servant is in fact Jesus that he is uh, Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man now as a man the Lord had to, to grow like us he had to learn like us. He had to be obedient like us. He had to be like us in every way except our sin. So that he could be, as I said, a perfect substitute for us. And Jesus, the servant, he grew and increased in wisdom and stature, Luke tells us, Luke, Luke 2.52. Hebrews 5 verse 8 tells us that as a son he had to learn obedience from the things he suffered. And of course in that great passage, Philippians 2 8, where having been found uh, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so the servant that we read here, uh, came and, and he was discipled. He was discipled by God the Father. As a man, Christ was discipled by God the Father and God the Spirit. Now I know when, when, you, when you hear that for the first time, it sounds a little bit alarming because well, isn't, he, isn't he God? Yes, he's God. He's truly God and he's truly man. And we have to hold those in equal balance. And as a man, to be truly man, he had to learn like we had to learn. And we see that actually expounded for us in this passage in Isaiah 50. And the lessons that we can learn from the servant, uh, we can draw from, from this passage. That in, us, in order for us to be discipled as Christ was discipled, or to be discipled by Christ, by the servant, is we need to first of all conform to his example and so that's my first point this morning to be discipled by the servant we need to conform to his example and we need to uh, comply to his exhortation so let me pray for us before we continue father we we are in need of your grace lord i am in need of your grace to speak clearly to speak accurately to speak truthfully, Lord, the word that you have opened to my eyes, Lord, and pressed upon my heart. Lord, help me that I would speak that and that, Lord, through the ministry of your word, through the working of your spirit, you would strengthen us, edify us, build us up, Lord, disciple us, Lord, I pray, and help us in that life, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so firstly, to conform to his example. Basically verses 4 um, well, through, to, through to 9. And there, there are two sections under that. First is that we see some characteristics of what a faithful disciple looks like. And secondly we see the confidence 
of a faithful disciple. So let's first of all look at the, the characteristics of a faithful disciple and the servant was the faithful disciple. First of all, we see that to be he was the servant was a learner. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. The faithful disciple must be a learner, must be someone who who receives instruction. A disciple is, is, is merely that is a word that means a learner, someone who has a teacher or a master, someone who's being taught truth. And here we see that God has given me, because that's the servant speaking, although we don't see that immediately, we understand from verse 10 that these are the words, verses 4 to 9 are the words of the servant speaking, he says, God has given me the tongue of, a dis of, of disciples. He has given me the ability, the responsibility, the role to speak, to teach others what I've been taught. Is, is the idea. Uh, and so in order for, 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 for him to have uh, uh, given, been given the tongue, the, the ability to speak, he had to be instructed himself. He had to be taught. Uh, he, he needed to grow in wisdom and stature in the Word of God. He had to receive the Word. I'll explain that a little bit more for you who are nervous at this stage. Uh, and uh, so first of all, the first point that I want to make is, is for us, if you want to be a faithful disciple, you need to be a learner like Christ was, like the servant was. And secondly, we need to be a helper because he was a helper. The second part, the second line of that verse is that I may know this is something that he was taught, that he was, that he was, that he was, that he learned himself, that he was instructed in, that I may know how to sustain, how to edify, help, come alongside the weary one with a word. And so, the servant, the perfect faithful disciple, was a learner, and secondly, he was a helper. He had others on his mind. He was others focused. He did not just study the scriptures for himself. He did not receive the word of God merely for himself, but it was to, to, to sustain, to help, to teach others, to sustain the, the weary one. Uh, he was a learner and he was a helper, a helper at heart. Uh, he came to, to, to sustain the weary one. The weary one there just means the one, someone who has been uh, fading or fainting under the pressures of life. Uh, maybe someone who has been winded by life. And uh, the servant was given the ability to come and sustain, come to help, come to uh, strengthen the weary one with a word. Not with his own ideas, not with his own imaginations, but with the divine word of God, that which he was taught. So we would say today that he helped someone biblically with the word of God. And only those who have heard the word of God, that has received the word of God, that has know the word of God that believes the word of God will be willing and able to use the word of God to encourage others, to help others, to sustain the weary one. And so be, to be a disciple, uh, to be discipled by the servant uh, means that we need to conform to his example. And we need to be in the word and receive the word as Christ received the word. We need to know it as he knew it. We need to be mindful also of others around us, of those who are in need of our help. And we need to do this, we need to receive this word daily. Back in our text says, He awakens me morning by morning. Here the servant says that every morning he basically was awakened by the Lord 
Now, the idea is to meet with Him, to receive the Word of God, in one sense, for that day. Now, remember that Jesus said that I did not speak my own, of my own initiative, uh, that as the Father Himself who sent me has given me commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Jesus only spoke the words that was given to him by the Father. He did not speak on his own initiative, on his own accord. So the word that he would use to sustain the weary one is the word that he would have learned from the scriptures and have been taught by the Holy Spirit. And it says here that he got up every morning, morning by morning. Now what is the implication for us? We need to be in the word morning by morning. You would say to me, Franz, Franz, you don't understand, I'm more of an evening person. <laughs> Discipline yourself. You may say to me, no, Franz, Franz, I'm more of a noonday person. I'm not so much the morning person nor the, an evening person, I'm, I'm more of a noonday person. Discipline yourself. And I, 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 mean, I don't want to make a, a, a hard and fast rule here. I don't want to press this matter apart from saying that I don't know of any other better way than to start your day than coming to the Lord. Be in His presence. Hearing Him speak to you through the Word. Praying to Him. Preparing yourself for the day. I mean, I don't, I don't know, maybe... You know of a team, but I don't know of any sports team who would have their tactical meeting after the game. Or maybe at half time. Or would embark on, on doing a, a recipe that you want to bake a cake and you read the recipe afterwards. It's just, it's just not wise. And so I understand that the point, the main point is, is be in the word daily. Uh, and I would propose to you that the best time of that before the day gets away from you would be the first thing that you that you would get up and, and be in the word. If you want a word from the Lord to sustain yourself and others in the day, then start the morning with Him. And of course that has implications to the night, what you do the night before. You need to get to bed at a reasonable hour in order to get up at a reasonable hour. Just I'll leave that for food for thought for you. But here we see that, that the disciple, uh, rather the servant, was a learner. He was a helper. He was disciplined. He got up and he met with the Lord morning by morning. And he sees, says here, goes on, he awakens me, my ear, to listen as a learner. He was attentive. And for us to be a disciple of Christ, we need to be attentive to what we read. It doesn't, it doesn't help if you get up every morning and you just read and not even pay attention. You just read because you want to maybe appease your conscience or, or maybe you have something to say to someone who would ask you, uh, have, what are you reading? Brother, you know, I could say, well, I, I was in the Psalms this morning. Uh, he was attentive to what he read. John 5, 90 says, The Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also do in like manner. <coughs> so Jesus was, was, was meeting with, with the Father as a faithful disciple, wanting to learn, wanting to know, wanting to hear, what is his instructions for the day, Lord? What, what, am I, what am I to do today? What am I to say today in my ministry? As a man, remember I'm talking here about Jesus as a man. Um, and he was attentive. And you and I need to be incredibly thankful for his focused attention. Because he had to live perfectly. Every word that he received from God, he had to obey perfectly. You and, and, and my, 
redemption was at stake. He could not have half heard or misunderstood or just... I, I, I get it. I, I know what you, what you mean. He, he, he listened attentively to the Word. And I, I, may we have that attitude to the Scriptures. That when we read the Scriptures, when we study the Scriptures, we may know that lives are at stake. That we interpret this correctly. That we would be willing to, 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 to preach and teach that accurately, rightly dividing the Word of God. Because salvation and sanctification depends on it. And so he was a learner, he was a helper, he was disciplined, he was attentive, and now he was obedient. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient. Praise God for that. Praise God for the servant who in his humanity was meticulously attentive to the Word and perfectly obedient to it. The faithful disciple is an obedient disciple. We know, of course, that we, when our obedience does not buy or earn God's acceptance. We, it merely displays it. It, it proves that we have been accepted by the Lord as we come to Him in Christ. We cannot earn it. We are saved by grace through faith alone. And we show our gratitude and our love to the Lord by obeying Him. For well, Christ had to obey perfectly for the sake of righteousness. He could not slip up one moment. Because you and I would not be saved if that happened. Hebrews tells us that the Lord Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, but yet, unlike us, he was without sin. John 8, 29, the servant said that he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, and I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And that must be our... Uh, 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 desire, that is the example that we ought to follow, is to be pleasing to the Lord. Even at his, at his, well I would say probably his greatest test was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed, Father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will. Perfectly obedient. And so for us to conform to his example, we need to be obedient to His will, walk in His way. And when we fail, you will note that I said when, not if. When we fail, we need to be obedient to come and confess that and receive His forgiveness. That which the servant, which Christ has purchased for us. We go on. Another characteristic, the last one here that I want to touch on is is commitment. Nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. That which the servant received morning by morning, that which he listened to as a disciple, that which he, his ear was open to, to understand, to receive and to be obedient of, that he was committed to. He stood on it. He did not waver. He was driven and directed by conviction. What he received he knew was the truth, the truth of God, the truth of his Father. He knew that the will of the Father is truth. And therefore it became His will. The way of the Lord became His way in His humanity. And so He was totally convinced of this truth. He was totally convinced of this, of its merit. He was totally committed to its fulfillment. And people, when we are committed, when we are 
when we have convictions, when as you, like the servants, study the scriptures morning by morning, listen to it attentively, seeking to obey, building up a conviction about what is truth, you can expect opposition. You can expect persecution. You can expect hostility, disagreement. That's just the nature of it. If you take a position say, this is true, that by definition means all these other things are not. If you're talking about the same topic. And the servant experienced that. You know that he was flogged, he turned his back. You know he was tortured, he was beaten with reeds on the head, with a crown of thorns was placed on his head, his beard was plucked out. He was slandered, he was humiliated, he was spat upon. Probably one of the most, probably the most grievous insult, in my view, you can do to another person is to spat on. Utterly degrading. But the faithful servant was unwavering. He was committed to the way and the will of the Lord, in spite of the cost. The personal cost to himself. Do you stand on your convictions? Do I? Are we committed to the word of God, the truth that we receive, that's been handed down to us once for all? Do we stand on that? I think commitment is probably one of the characteristics most lacking in the church today among Christians, and I would probably put Christians in brackets. God said, I created the world in six, world, six literal days. Disciples says, we don't agree. God said, I made man and woman equal but different, fill a different role at home, different role in the church. Many disciples say, that's not true either. God said marriage is between one man, one woman, one for life. Even some Christian circles say, that's not true either. We disagree. God said that I will save you from your sin through the vicarious substitutionary death of my son. Some say today that is costly challenges. I'm not talking about unbelievers here, I'm talking about people who profess Christ. God said, there's only one way to heaven, that is through Jesus Christ. Many disciples say, I think we know better. The good Muslim can go to it. The good Hindu can go to it. There are many paths to heaven. When you stand on these things, expect opposition. Expect persecution. And I mean, long before we even come to these things, do we stand on the commitments that Christ expects of us in everyday life? Do we love others as we are commanded to love? Do we share our faith with others? Or are we afraid? Afraid of what? Afraid of rejection. Afraid of opposition. Scripture says that we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus daily. Paul wrote this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives with me. The faith that I now the, the, the life that I now live, uh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. To 
come to Christ means we need to die to self. And while we still cling on to ourselves, we will not stand on these truths. While we're still more concerned for our life and our what people perceive of us, we will not stand. We will not be committed to these truths. I think we can do with some of the Puritans' attitude. There was an English Puritan, William Gurnall, Gurnall, I think so. He says, "Do not be, or do not fear, do not be afraid." You have no life to lose. In Christ you already did. I like that. And the servant, the faithful disciple is worthy of our imitation. We need to be conformed to his example. Cultivate these characteristics of being a learner, a helper, disciplined, attentive, obedient, committed. And we will only do so when we uh, have the confidence that the faithful disciple had, that the servant had. Verse 7, we read, For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up. To each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is you who condemns me? Behold, they will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. The servant had a great confidence in the Lord. He had great trust in, in, in God. Confident that he can do this, that he is strengthened by the Lord, that he is that he is helped by the by the Lord, and therefore he depended on that help. He entrusted himself to that help, and he was his help in in following these characteristics and building these characteristics in his life. And as we likewise should trust and, and seek help from the Lord to build these into our lives. We cannot do this by our own strength. If you try, I can guarantee you, you would fail. And if you, the more you submit to the, to the Spirit and the, the, the leading of the Spirit and the strength of the Spirit in you, then you will be able to start doing this characteristically. But here in the context, he says that in particular when we have to count the cost of commitment. When we stand on the truth of God, the Lord helps us. He is with us. And we can know that we will not be disgraced. In this world you will be. In this world you will be humiliated. But not before the one that matters. You will not be displaced because it's the truth of God. You will not be ashamed. Therefore, he set his face like flint. Really, he's, he's resolute, he's, he's unwavering, unyielding, hard headed in a, in, a, in a sense. That whatever comes against him, he is set on what he believes and what he's going to do. And so should we. Knowing that the Lord God will vindicate him. Knowing that the Lord God will help him. And so therefore he invites people. Who is there who wants to contend with us? Who wants to contend really with God? We are merely the messengers. If they have an issue, then they have an issue with God. Apostle Paul, after expanding on the or expounding the gospel in, in Romans and God's sovereignty in salvation, I think he probably had this passage in mind when he wrote these words when he says, 
What shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who intercedes for us. The servant had great confidence in God. His helper. He's, he's the one who vindicates him. Peter reminds us uh, in, his, in his letter about suffering that we should, when we, when, we, when we seek to live like Christ, when we seek to follow His example, when we walk in righteousness, that we should not be surprised when we are accused, when we are opposed, when we are attacked, when we are slandered, when we are reviled and humiliated, because Christ has experienced all these things. First Peter 2 21 says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteousness. People, do you have conviction? Do you know the truth? Stand. More and more, Scripture warns us that in the last days there will be more and more people that will forsake the truth. Oh, we rise of people that will stand on His Word. Unwavering, regardless of the cost. And disciplined learning, disciplined or attentive learning, obedient learning will produce strong convictions, will produce commitment, will produce faith. <clears throat> we read that while we stand in God's Help by His grace. We read that those who would contend with us, those who would oppose us, like they did the servant, they will wear out like a garment, and the moth will eat them. There will always be enemies to God's eternal truths. There will always be detractors of sound doctrine. There will always be criers to compromise but they are the ones that will wear out like a garment and then will be eaten like a, like a moth-eaten garment and of course these things don't happen overnight we only see clothes wear out over a period of time that's why God's grace and God's design But let us not be among them. Let us be among those who are like the servant, committed, confident in the Lord. And so we've seen if we want to be a disciple of Christ, a disciple of the servant, then we need to conform to his example. And we need to comply with the Lord's exhortation. Verse 10 and 11. Who is among you that fear the Lord, fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire. And among the brands you have set ablaze, this you will have for my hand. You will lie down in torment. And really, in these two verses, we, we find this, this contrast. This contrast between two people, two people, two persons, really. The faithful and the faithless. 
in verse 10 describes to us the faithful disciple, the one who fears the Lord. That is the one who reveres the Lord, who, who honors the Lord, who, who respects the Lord. And how do we know that? Because he obeys the voice of his servant. And really the, the Greek grammar indicates that we know that he fears the Lord. Why? Because he obeys the, the Lord. And, and this obedience is not just occasionally, it's characteristically. It's continually. That's why I believe this verse speaks of a faithful servant. In spite of the next line, which sort of may stump us if we, if we don't understand it correctly. It says that walks in darkness and has no light. How are we to understand that? Surely, we, is, is this, can this be true of a Christian? Can it be true of a believer? And I think we need to understand what Isaiah was meant here, what the word means here when, with the word darkness. The word darkness here does not speak of Darkness as in absence of truth, absence of, 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 uh, of knowledge of, of the servant, because it's the one who obeys the voice of the servant. It's the one who, who fears the Lord that also walks in darkness and has no light. I think what this is referring to, this is someone who obeys the Lord, and who finds himself in circumstances where they just cannot see light at the end of the tunnel. Where things are difficult, where things are hard. This speaks of the hard road of obedience. This speaks of faith. Hold on, even when you don't know what the outcome will be. Even when you don't see the end. Hold on, be faithful. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God. So the darkness here does not speak of the darkness of not knowing the Lord. But it speaks of faithfulness in the midst of darkness. Faith is given to us for times of darkness. When we, when we don't know, when, when you are in a situation, you just don't know, Lord, is there no end? What is going to happen? Trust the Lord. Walk in the Lord. Obey the Lord. Darkness is what faith is really for. If we could see, we would not need faith. Faith sort of offsets darkness. Sometimes you may be in darkness because you're obedient to the Lord. The exhortation is Keep trusting, keep believing, keep walking, don't give up. Somebody said, that, but didn't Jesus say that I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light, the light of life, John 8, 12. So how do we reconcile these two? Again, I said, because darkness in John 8, 12 speaks of Ignorance in the sense of not knowing the servant, not knowing the Lord. It is darkness because God has turned His back on us. He's turned His face away. It's the darkness of rejection, the darkness of eternal hell that He spoke, speaking about there. Christ is the light. We need to come to Him. He is the servant who came, and as, as we read earlier, that He would be a light to the nations. Now, if we come to the light and we receive Him, now we need to walk in that, even though our circumstances may be darkness. But if we do not come to Him, if we do not obey His voice, if we do not fear the Lord, then we do not have the light of life. And so, to understand this properly, the walks in darkness here and is uh, referring to the darkness of our circumstances that requires us to walk by faith. And that is contrast with the, with the faithless. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with firebrands, walk in your light, the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set in place. The faithless, when times are hard, 
when they can't see the end, when they can't see an outcome, light the light of their own understanding. Grab the light of the world's explanation. I'd rather go to walk with this, my, 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 my plans, my ideas, and not God's ideas, not the servant's words. Well, it's much easier, it's, it's less conflict, it's, it's more convenient, it's less restrictive. And so the faithless live by the light of their own imagination, intuition, understanding, knowledge, the wisdom of man. Instead of holding fast to the words of the servant, to the word of God, when life is difficult, when we don't see an outcome. Proverbs 16.25 tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in the way of death. And so the exhortation here for us is be faithful. Don't be faithless. Listen to the voice of the servant. Even when you can't see the outcome. In your marriage, are you going to live by God's light or your own understanding? Husband, are you going to love your wife as Christ commands you? Wives, are you going to submit and respect your husbands as Christ? Or do you do have a better idea, a more enlightened idea? In your parenting, are you going to raise your children in the ways of the Lord, in the instruction and discipline? Or are you going to listen? the world's methods and the world's ways of raising your child. There's every aspect of our lives we have to choose. Am I going to follow God's way or am I going to do it my way? Am I going to light the firebrand that's talking about there is it's really a torch? Am I going to light a lamp for myself? To walk myself out of this darkness, or how am I going to cling to Christ, cling to His Word, even though I can't see what's coming or what's next, and I don't know how long this is going to take place, this is going to last. The exhortation for us is to be faithful, because the faithless will lie down in torment. Really, in the place of suffering, euphemism for hell. You will suffer in this life, and you will suffer eternally in the life to come. And so, if you are in Christ this morning, there is some very practical example for us to follow the example of the servant. And there's an urgent exhortation for us to remain faithful. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for reminding us Lord, to look to Christ, look to our Savior Jesus Christ, Lord, who in his humanity, Lord, had to walk as we walk, had to look to you, Lord, for, for your word, for, for instruction. Well, it's difficult for us to get our minds around that. But the word is clear that you had to be made like us in every way, but yet without sin. And so we, we marvel at the work of Christ to be sinlessly perfect throughout all of his life, absolutely yielded to the Spirit and to the Word. Perfect. 
Lord, we thank you that you were able to do that. And that that has been credited to our account. When we come with repentant faith. And Lord, we want to continue because of such a great love that you've given us, because of such a great redemption that we want to be discipled by you. And Lord, what better way than to follow your example, to conform to your example, and to comply to your exhortation. Help us, Lord, in this week and every day of our lives to follow hard after you be pleasing to you, to hear the words one day, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in Jesus' name.